Hello everyone, I am delighted to introduce Oliver Kopp, who is here to talk to us about protecting your machine learning against drift. Um, hello Oliver and welcome to Europython. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, London. Uh, not so far from me, I'm in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I'm very excited for this talk, so without any further ado, I will let you take it away. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. I'm Oliver Cobb. I'm an applied machine learning researcher at Selden, which is a machine learning deployment and monitoring company. Here at Selden, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can best enable our users to deploy their machine learning models in a manner that's responsible and robust, such that they can be trusted to automate processes of real world consequence. One way in which trust can be instilled is by having systems in place that can detect when the model is being asked to operate on data from a distribution that differs to that on which it was trained. These systems are called drift detectors, and they'll be the focus of this talk. In the data science and research team here at Selden, we develop and maintain an open source Python library, Alibi Detect, which provides implementations of state-of-the-art algorithms for drift detection, as well as outlier detection and adversarial detection. But this presentation will focus solely on drift detection. In particular, we will look at what drift is and why it pays to detect it, the different ways in which drift can manifest itself, how drift can be de detected in a principled manner where we're able to differentiate systemic change from natural fluctuations, the anatomy of a drift detector and the various components of which they're made up, and hopefully along the way we can demystify some concepts such as online detectors, permutation tests, MMD tests, etc which might appear a little abstract or theoretical when you stumble across them in the Alibi Detect docs, for example, but at least in the context of drift detection are relatively intuitive. And then, yeah, we'll finish up with a practical demonstration showing how you can use the Alibi Detect Python library. Okay, so let's dive in and set the scene into which we will introduce drift detectors. Um, this is the sort of standard supervised machine learning context, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar. So I suppose there's some quantity Y that we'd like to use as part of some decision-making process, be that manual or automated. Sadly, we can't observe Y, but we can instead observe some features that are related to Y in some probabilistic manner. So what we do is we fit a model to predict the target from the features and then use the model's predictions in place of the unobservable quantity. So here is a simple example. We've got a binary classification problem where we'd like to be able to predict a category, naught or one, given the features X1 and X2. To make this a little bit more concrete, we're going to think of each data point as representing a person, X1, an indication of their economic conservatism, X2, an indication of their social conservatism, and then the category is their voting intention, with the blue data points uh, representing those who are intending to vote for the UK Conservative Party, and the red data points those intending to vote for the UK Labour Party. And you see here that we've got two sort of clusters of voters, one of particularly economically and socially conservative individuals and another of economically and socially liberal, uh, which is obviously a bit of a simplification, but it's the example that we're going to roll with. Um, and then suppose that we fit some model to predict their voting intention from these features, and the decision boundary is given by this black dotted line. Um, it might turn out that, say, on held out, and then we wish to use this model as part of some downstream application, for example, a uh, targeted ad campaign, for example, where we send voters ads depending on which way we predict that they'll vote. The way this works is that we get, a, get an indication of how well we expect our model to perform on future data points by looking at how well it performs on held out training instances. And that then comforts us in using our model in deployment. However, this is only a good indication assuming the process underlying the data remains constant over time. There's various reasons why, in practice, this might not necessarily hold, and we'll come on to those in a moment. So yeah, this sets up nicely what precisely drift is, and it is simply when the process underlying the data that arrives during deployment differs from that which underlies the training data. And this is problematic because when such a change occurs, we can no longer expect the model's performance during deployment to match that observed on held out training uh, data. So in effect, we're flying blind and we don't know how well our model is performing 
Many of you are probably thinking that you really don't care if our targeted ad campaign suffers. So before we proceed, I'm going to introduce this example from medical imaging, which will hopefully help better motivate the problem. Um, so suppose that we would like to train a model to predict whether these tissue scans are benign or cancerous. Um, for the training data, we collect scans from a mixture of three different hospitals. We train our model and we observed on held out training instances, it achieves a classification accuracy of 93%. Suppose this is better than some human baseline, than they suppose it's 90%, for example. We then might decide it's worth deploying our model um, for use on future patients. Um, but then once the model is deployed, it might work well initially if it's been queried with scans, with the same underlying distribution. For example, if it was deployed from scans from the same hospitals, but then suppose the new hospital started using the model and the distribution underlying their scans was subtly different in some way. So for example, maybe due to a different dem demographic of patient, or for example, here it looks a bit like potentially the stain used in the microscope might have been slightly different. And when such a change occurs, we can no longer um, rely on our model to perform at the level it did on held out training instances. And therefore it might end up misdiagnosing patients and putting them at unnecessary risk. So that's a very concrete example of why these drift detection functionality can be needed. Okay, and yeah, by the process underlying the data, we're of course referring to this joint probability distribution. And this is useful because it helps us to categorize the different ways in which drift can occur. And we do that by noting that the joint distribution can be decomposed in two different ways. And returning to our voting intention example, we'll now see what the different um, types of drift correspond to. So recall that this is what the undrifted data looked like, so the training data. Um, one way that drift can occur is with the distribution of the features remaining the same, but their relationship to the target changes. So applied to our example, there might, for example, be some new tax policy that means that voters no longer intend to vote along economic lines, but purely along social lines. And then our model might end up sort of misclassifying these individuals who are particularly sort of economically conservative, but socially liberal or socially conservative and economically liberal and the model's performance will suffer. Another type of drift that can occur is what we call prior probability drift, where, where, the, where given an individual's voting intention, their, their features keep the same underlying distribution, but it's the proportion of voters that fall into each category that has changed, as you can see here. And when this happens, what was previously a suitable model decision boundary no longer looks suitable because the individuals falling uh, close to the decision boundary are now overwhelmingly conservative, whereas before it was 50 50. And therefore, the model is going to misclassify a lot more individuals, and the model performance will suffer. Another way in which drift can occur is what we call covariate drift, where it might be that the relationship between the target and the features remains the same, but the distribution of the features changes. So, suppose that there's some change in society, which means that individuals are pushed towards conservative and liberal extremes, or alternatively, they're sort of brought together into more of a central cluster. Although the relationship between the features and the target has remained the same, and therefore it makes sense to keep the same model decision boundary, it now turns out that the model performance could still change dramatically. So if they're pushed away from each other, the model actually might perform better because there's less data points falling into this region on which the model is uncertain. But when they're brought together, suddenly it's a much harder problem for the model to solve and it ends up misclassifying far more um, points, the model performance will drop. So these types of drift where the model performance de that causes the model performance to decrease is referred to as malicious drift. You might be thinking that this looks like a relatively sort of straightforward problem and that as the data arrives, we can just monitor some metric of model performance. And if it looks like it's decreasing, we can say, oh, well, malicious drift is occurring. Let's take corrective action. Um, but it's actually not that simple because in practice, the data points usually 
the deployment data usually looks more like this, where we don't observe the labels. Our data doesn't arrive labeled. And this forces us to look for the change directly in the feature space. And this is far more challenging because the features can often be very high dimensional and complex. Um, so whereas in this example, they're only 2D, you can sort of eyeball it and say, oh, well, there's clearly been drift here or drift here. If you instead imagine that these data points are like collections of images or text, suddenly it's a much more challenging problem to know when a change has occurred. Um, and this is the unsupervised drift detection context, which is yeah, typically much harder. So given that we're looking for change in the future space, how can we actually go about detecting drift? Because we don't expect the deployment data to look identical to training data, because we expect there to be some sort of natural fluctuations. So for example, if this is our training data and this, this data arrived during deployment, we might look at this and say, oh, well, the clusters do look like they're potentially slightly closer together, but is that a systemic change or could that have just been a natural fluctuation? But if this batch of data arrived, where it certainly looks like there's more of one big central cluster, we'd probably be quite comfortable identifying that with drift and we'd probably take some sort of corrective action. But the problem is, where do we draw the line? How much like deviation do we allow before we say, well, that's been drift, we need to correct for it. And the way that we can approach this in a principled manner is via statistical hypothesis testing, which I'll now quickly review for those of you who didn't take stats at school or are desperately trying to forget the experience, um, the way it works. So leaving the drift detection context for a moment, so more generally, before observing some data, we specify some null hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis about the data generating process. We also specify a test statistic which we expect to be small under the null hypothesis and large under the alternative hypothesis. We then observe the data and compute the actual value that the test statistic takes. And then we also compute what's called a p-value, which is a probability that such an extreme value of the test statistic would have been observed if the null hypothesis is true. And the idea here is that a low p-value discredits the null hypothesis. It's like saying we could continue to believe the null hypothesis, but then we'd also have to believe that we just happen to observe some extremely unlikely data. Um, so yeah, the way it works is we normally specif specify a threshold. And if the p-value falls below that threshold, we reject the null hypothesis. Um, and even if there's been no, even if the null hypothesis is true, that occurs with probability equal to the threshold. But at least this means allows us to reject the null hypothesis in a manner where the false positive rate is known. Okay, so returning to the drift detection context, the way in which we apply this is by denoting by Q0, distribution underlying the training data on which our model was fit. Q1, distribution underlying a batch of deployment data. And we take as a null hypothesis that the two distributions are the same, and the alternative hypothesis that the two distributions differ in some way. And then we try and specify a test statistic, so a function of the training and deployment data that we expect to be small if the, null if the two distributions are the same, and we expect to be large if they're different. We then compute the p-value and the flag drift if it falls below some uh, false positive rate that we desire. And the hard part here is in specifying this test statistic. So this is a function of potentially high dimensional complex data that we expect to be small under no drift, large under drift. And that's, that's a difficult problem, specifying that test statistic. And even if we are able to do it, how do we then associate it with a p-value that determines how extreme it is? This is the sort of problem that we're looking to solve. But lest you think that's not challenging enough, in practice, we don't observe the deployment data as like one big batch that we can com then compare to the reference data. It actually arrives sequentially over time like this, it evolves. And when drift occurs, we'd like to detect it as soon as possible. Um, so the way that we formalize this problem is by saying, by assuming that the data follows the pre-chain, so the training data distribution up until some change point T star, and after and then there's a change and it then follows some alternative distribution 
that each time step, we'd like to perform a hypothesis test of whether or not drift has already occurred. So every time, say, has drift occurred yet? Um, and yeah, so desired properties of algorithms designed to tackle this problem is that we'd like them to be fast to respond when drift does occur. So we formalize this expected detection delay, which is the expected difference between the time t dash at which we flag drift and the time t star at which drift occurs. We'd like that expected detection delay to be small. However, we'd only like it to be small, subject to the constraint of a known frequency of false detections when there has been no change. Um, you know, we can formalize this as the expected runtime, which is the expect which is the average time which drift is detected even when there hasn't been a change. So you can think of the change point being at infinity because it's never occurred. Yeah, you might have noticed here there's sort of an, an inherent trade-off where we'd like the detectors to have this low detection delay, but that requires sort of sensitivity, which means that the detector is also more um susceptible to natural fluctuations that might uh, trigger a false detection and therefore the expected runtime is also low which we don't want so yeah we have to balance that trade-off and yeah this point is often overlooked actually and um, the ability to specify the frequency of false detections in the absence of change um, often algorithms allow you to lower bound this expected runtime but that's not particularly useful because the action that we'd take in response to sort of a one in a hundred event is entirely different to the action that we'd take in response to say a one in 10,000 event. It's important to be able to know accurately how significant a detection is when it occurs so that we can respond appropriately. Okay, so you might be wondering how we can apply the sort of statistical hypothesis testing framework to the data that's now arriving sequentially. And the way that we do this is by collecting the deployment instances together into test windows. And these can then be compared to the reference data or window using test statistics in the way that we described before. Um, yeah, there's actually various strategies you can adopt for collecting the instances into windows. And the different ways of doing this, actually, the characteristics and properties of drift detectors often derive from how they approach this windowing. Um, so we now describe some of the main strategies for doing this. So here, if you Consider the data here arriving sequentially. So you've got t equals one, two, three, et cetera. These are the features plotted here. One way we can window the data is using disjoint windows, where we specify a window say, a size of, say, five, collect the first five instances together, perform a test, consider whether or not the test statistic is below some threshold. Above some threshold, if it is, we flag drift. If not, the window slides along to the next five instances. We perform another test. Etc. cetera, and the window progresses like that. An alternative is using overlapping windows, where again, we fix a window size, but this time, after performing a test, you only slide the window along by one rather than um, by five, and therefore the window contains much of the same data. Perform another test, and it progresses like that. The third way in which we can window the data, and algorithms that implicitly adopt this approach, often don't formulize, formalize, formulate their approach as a windowing strategy, um, but I find it particularly useful to think of it in this way, is by instantiating the window with just a single instance. And not only do we perform a test of whether or not there's evidence of drift, but we consider whether or not we should allow the window to grow. If there's no evidence for drift, we reset the window to size one and just start again and perform another test. But if there is, then a data point that's indicative of drift, but not so much so that it causes a detection, we keep it in the window and allow the window to grow. Perform another test, more evidence, allow the window to grow. And this allows the window to grow and accumulate evidence over time, which when drift is slight, this can be particularly useful because we don't just cut the window short and move on. We allow it to accumulate if the evidence is there. Okay, so yeah, and all these different windowing strategies call for different test statistics and different mechanisms for determining the thresholds above which the test statistics should fall. 
Um, yeah, and each of those strategies also have their own pros and cons, which we'll uh, dive into a little now. So firstly, for the disjoint window detectors, the sort of distinguishing characteristic is that the tests are independent because the windows are disjoint and they're performed infrequently because you only perform them every, say, five or a bit more realistically, say, 500 um, instances that arrive. Um, and this is, this is good because we can then take any test statistic and then it's actually possible to accurately estimate the p-value that says how extreme that test statistic, is, test statistic is because we can perform a what's called a permutation test. Um, this would be too expensive to perform at every time, in, time step, um, say for overlapping windows. But in this disjoint window framework, we have time to perform these. And these are actually dead intuitive how they work. So I'm quickly just going to overview them. So where they work is we take the, um, the reference window and the test window, and we define a function that is able to shuffle all of the data um, such that we then have two new windows that contains a mix of reference and test data points that are completely shuffled together. We then compute the value of the test statistic on a large number of these shuffled windows. And then we look at we look at the value of the test statistic on the unshuffled windows relative to all of the values on the shuffled windows, and we see how extreme it is. So if, it, for example, it was at the 99th percentile, then it would be in the top 1% of extremeness, and that gives us a p-value that says how extreme the test statistic was. Um, the idea here is that if there's been no change, then it doesn't matter whether or not we shuffle the data or not because they all have the same underlying distribution. And therefore, we don't expect the shuffled, the unshuffled test statistic to lie at an, at an extreme end. Um, so if it does lie in the top 1%, then yeah, that's only a one in a one in a hundred event, for example. And that gives us the p-value. Um, another key advantage of the disjoint window detectors is that we don't actually necessarily have to specify the test statistic, which as, as mentioned before, can be a huge pain. We can actually use a portion of the data to learn the test statistic. So we can train a function to be small under no change and large under change. Um, and that completely gets around this problem of specifying the statistic. Um, the cons of disjoint window detectors is that they're very sensitive to the choice of window size, because if you use a small window size, then there likely won't be enough evidence in any given window to allow drift to be detected. But if you use a very large window size, then suddenly we're only performing a test every, say, 500, 1,000 instances. And therefore, the detection delay is necessarily going to be large because, well, we have to wait until the next test point regardless. Um, and that means that the detectors are particularly slow to respond to severe drift. Because it doesn't matter how severe, severely drifted the instances are, we still have to wait until the next test point before they can uh, cause drift to be flagged. Um, and yeah, so then looking at overlapping window detectors, which are much trickier actually, because consecutive test statistics are highly correlated. This is because test statistics are at successive time steps are functions of much the same data, and therefore they're going to be correlated. And this makes specifying the relationship between like thresholds and expected run times uh, much trickier, um, because even if we can identify the threshold above which the first test statistic um, resides with only probability, say, one in a thousand. Given that we make it to the second time step, the probability that the second test statistic then exceeds that threshold is then some unknown value much rarer than one in a thousand, because we already know that it didn't cause a detection at the first time step. So you sort of have this correlation, which makes things much trickier. Um, and yeah, this is something that we've spent a lot of time sort of researching at Selden, how we can capture this relationship between thresholds and run times for the overlapping window detectors. And it turns out that you, there is actually a way in which we can estimate sort of time varying thresholds that allow the desired expected run time to be targeted. However, we then have these sort of additional constraints on the test statistic um, that we didn't have for the disjoint window detectors where it must be possible to update them incrementally. Um, because we're performing tests every time step, it's important that 
we don't have to compute them from scratch every time because that'd be too costly. And also we can't learn the test statistics like we did for the disjoint window detectors. We have to be able to specify them at the outset, which, yeah, as I mentioned, is a bit of a pain. But if we can do that, they're computationally light because of the incremental, incremental manner in which they operate. And they can be very fast to respond to severe drift because the severely drifted instances filter into the test window immediately. We don't have to wait until the next test point. We perform tests every, every time step, and therefore we're faster to respond when severe drift occurs. Okay, a final way of rendering the data is these adaptive windows, and these introduce additional complexities. Um, and these typically work by accumulating some notion of outlierness, at least approaches for which the pace change distribution is unknown and they operate at fixed cost. This is how they normally work. The way that this works is you sort of score each instance independently as they arrive, where they receive a negative score if they look relatively inlying, and a positive score if they look uh, outlying. The way this works is that prior to a change, if we accumulate these uh, scores, we expect a sort of downward trajectory that keeps decreasing. But then if there's a if there's a change, then suddenly the data points are going to start appearing more outlying and the, trajectory, and the trajectory will start to rise. And, what, and then the challenge here is specifying the threshold um, for how much of a rise we allow before we detect drift. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's, again, a very challenging problem, um, specifying this threshold to correspond to a desired expected runtime. And we did spend some time looking at this at Selden because we thought these adaptive windows uh, were very nice in the way that they allowed the test window to grow. However, it turns out that this idea of accumulating, accumulating outlierness is actually not great for drift detection. It doesn't result in good, in low delays. Um, it's a little bit surprising because it was quite an intuitive idea we thought. Um, but we're now going to look at why that's the case. I think it helps illustrate the difference between drift detection and outlier detection. So if we suppose our pre-change distribution is this sort of isotropic Gaussian distribution with the brighter region in the middle representing region of high probability density and the darker regions lower probability density and think of these pink points as representing our reference set or training, dis training data points. Then suppose during deployment, we observe data that's much more tightly clustered, say these seven data points here, which we can eyeball and say they're from a different distribution that's much more tightly clustered, some sort of drift has occurred. The problem with the outlier-based methods is that if you can consider the points in isolation, you treat these points exactly the same as you treat these points. Um, and suddenly, they're probably not data points that you'd have looked at and said, oh, there's been drift. Um, so by considering them in isolation, we're not able to capture that. And that's why looking solely at how outlying data points are is insufficient for drift detection. Okay, so having ruled out outlier-based test statistics as insufficient, um, how do we propose that test statistics should be formulated? Um, and the ones that work particularly well are those which estimate the distance between the underlying distributions. So these, fun so these distributions are unknown, but we aim to estimate the distance using the data that we observe. Um, one way that you might think of doing this is by using the data to sort of model the two distributions and then plugging them into some notion of distance between the distributions. Um, however, with few data points uh, that we normally have um, in practice, this is an inefficient way to approach the problem. What we instead do is try and estimate some notion of distance between the distributions directly. Um, and one distance between distributions that appears particularly prominently in our library Alibi Detect is this maximum mean discrepancy distance, um, which we find particularly useful for various reasons. Um, so we're now going to quickly overview how that distance works. Okay. So the reason this is useful is because it transforms the problem of specifying the distance between the underlying distributions to simply specifying 
a similarity between data points, which is a sort of much simpler, more intuitive problem. Um, and typically, we do this by projecting raw, unstructured, potentially high dimensional data points onto lower dimensional, more structured representations using some projection, phi, and then evaluating some simple notion of similarity, such as an inner product. Um, and this is great because this is possible across all data modalities. So for images, for the projection, we might use some pre-trained convolutional network, for example, for text, some pre-trained transformer, um, or whatever. Um, so yeah, this is uh, particularly straightforward. The maximum mean discrepancy can then be defined in various ways, but in this context, probably most simply, is the expectation of the similarity between reference instances added to the similarity between deployment instances take away two times the similarity between reference and deployment instances. Um, and this distance can be estimated from the data simply by taking the average similarities. Um, so it's, this is a particularly convenient way uh, distance that can be estimated very simply. Um, but regardless of like what we're trying to estimate here, we can look at this as our test statistic, which satisfies the properties that we want of our test statistic. Um, because uh, if, the, if the two distributions are the same, then we expect the average similarity between reference instances to be the same as the similarity between test instances to be the same as the distance between the two. And therefore, these terms all cancel out, and the, and the test statistic is low. Um, but if there has been some change, then one or more of these terms will be different, and they don't cancel out, and it'll be large. So this allows us to specify our test statistic to have that property of low under uh, no change, high under change, which is what we want. Um, yeah, and often you'll see it written like this, which is a bit more intimidating. Um, but yeah, just it is a very simple concept in terms of average similarities. Um, so yeah, so if we return to the example which outlier-based test statistics were insufficient to tackle, here we're able to see that the deployment instances are much more similar, much closer together than the reference instances and the sort of distance between the two. And therefore, when we add up these terms, they don't cancel out and we get a relatively large test statistic value. Um, and then, this is, this is great, but then we need to determine precisely how extreme is that value in order to associate a p-value and uh, decide whether or not it's a flag drift. And the way that we can do that is using the permutation test that we described before. So here, on all of the shuffled reference and test windows, the similarities between the shuffled reference instances, the shuffled deployment instances, and the cross-similarity between the two, are all the same in expectation, and on average, they cancel out. So for example, we get very small values, and therefore, we expect the MMD estimate to be much higher on the unshuffled version, and on the shuffled versions, it ends up in the top, say, 1%, and then we're able to use that to flag drift. Um, and yeah, that's uh, pretty much all of the theory I was planning uh, to go through. Um, so in future, when you're trying to recall how drift detectors work, I highly recommend you think of this sort of funky looking fella with alibi detect glasses and know that there are three main components that define a drift detector. There's the strategy for collecting the deployment instances into test windows, a test statistic, which is then able to compare those test windows to the reference window or the training data. And this might involve specifying some projection as we described before. And additionally, we then have some strategy for, the, for setting thresholds, which those test statistics must remain below in order for drift not to be detected. And it's important that these three components are able to work together in a manner that allows the expected runtime to be specified. So that when drift occurs, we know precisely how significant it is and therefore can take appropriate action. Um, so yeah, this is a sort of dial that we can tune. And as we do under the hood, 
this expected detection delay will vary, but this isn't what we directly manipulate. This is just sort of a downstream effect. And yeah, as I say, we've got various drift detectors um, implemented in our Alibi Detect library. And if I've got time, yeah, I've got time to just give you a quick demonstration of how the library can be used. So hopefully this will work. I just put together a pretty short Jupyter notebook to demonstrate how the library can be used. Um, I won't have time to go through all of the code line by line, but I'll try and pick out the most relevant points. Um, there's a load of imports here, which aren't particularly important. Uh, but for the data, we're going to return to the Chameleon 17 medical imaging data set that we described earlier, where we wanted to train a model to classify tissue scans as benign or cancerous. And, but during deployment, we start getting instances um, from an alternative uh, hospital with a slightly different distribution. Um, so, and yeah, this data set is particularly convenient to use because there's this Python library. So the Wilds Python library, which is put together by a team from Stanford, that allows you to load and uh, manipulate this data particularly easily um, using these sorts of uh, chameleon, uh, well, wilds.get data set functions. But I just create this sort of wrapper around this to convert the data into a stream in order to simulate a sort of live deployment environment. We then define a reference set of n equals 2,500 instances. And then we also define two streams, one representing no change. So the instances are from the same distribution as training data, so this one, and one stream from the drifted hospital uh, where there has been a change. Um, this is slightly simplified the problem, kind of put the change point at zero, but by considering these streams and looking at how the detector, how long the detectors run for on these two streams allow, will allow us to investigate the average runtime and the average delay and see how that compares to like, the expected runtime that we desired. Um, so I'll quickly just uh, plot here some instances from the no change stream. It looks like like this, find the drift detector. We're going to use a strategy of overlapping windows, and we're going to use the test statistic, an estimator of the MMD that can be updated incrementally, and therefore is suitable for the overlapping window context. Um, as I mentioned before, because these images are quite high dimensional and unstructured, we first perform a projection down onto a lower dimensional and more structured representation. Um, in order for the kernel to be more meaningful and the MMD to be a useful test statistic. Um, and to do this, we train an autoencoder that passes the images through a lower dimensional representation such that they're able to be reconstructed. And therefore, it captures the sort of structure of the images in that lower dimensional representation. And here is just a convolutional autoencoder defined in PyTorch. Um, here you can see the autoencoder being defined um, there's a sequential PyTorch model, and yeah, we just uh, pass the reference data to a PyTorch data loader module. Um, and yeah, and then Alibi Detect provides a function that allows you to train sort of these components particularly easily. So we train the autoencoder, and you sort of see the loss going down here, such that it's been trained, and then. We define a function that uses the uh, autoencoder's encoder um, to map the images. So, because Alibi Detect expects functions mapping NumPy arrays to NumPy arrays, we just wrap the encoder within this function that just does a bit of uh, conversions for us. Okay, and having now defined the projection that we're going to use for our kernel, defining the detector is actually then very straightforward. Simply specify the expected runtime we desire, the size of the test windows we'd like to use, number of simulations we'd like to use to configure thresholds 
then we simply import from Alibi Detect um, what's called the MMD Drift Online Detector. So just overlapping windows using MMD. Called the detector, which the detector flags drift. Um, just to be expected one time. I'm only averaging over 15 runs this time so it's a very noisy estimate and it's not that close to the expected runtime of 150 but if we averaged even more run times it would gradually converge in on 150. Um, yeah so this is the sort of false positive rate on average it takes a false positive every one in 122 time steps um, and yeah we can sort of look at the detectors test statistics and thresholds and sort of see what was happening under the hood. Um, the test statistics sort of fluctuated around zero, but then eventually there's a fluctuation large enough to send it over the threshold. And that happened at time step 163, as you can see here. But then when we apply the detector to stream on which there has been a change, um, the detector then only runs for, on average 14 time steps. So this is a sort of estimate of the expected detection delay. Um, and this is great because it shows that the drift detector is working and that it flags drift much more quickly when there has been a change than when there hasn't, um, which is obviously the property that we'd like. Um, and in this case, you can see that the test statistics started rising very quickly from the start and very quickly exceeded the test threshold that the detector had uh, calibrated. Um, yes, yeah, so that's pretty much all there is to it. I hope uh, that was useful. I'll return to the slides. And yeah, if you found this interesting, do check out our open source Python library, Alibi Detect, that you can find here. And also, you can follow us on Twitter. We only just set up a Twitter account this week. Um, so if you'd like to receive updates, it's Selden. Okay. Okay, looks like it's been a problem. Okay, so it looks like I uh, broke up a bit there, I'm um, hearing. Um, where, where did I get to? I don't know if someone can help me out a little. Um, I think I was pretty much uh, wrapped up anyway. I was just saying you can follow us on Twitter if you'd like to receive updates on our research and our Python libraries, or if you need to contact me personally, I'm oc at selden.io. Um, I hope that there wasn't too much of a disconnect there. But yeah, that's, uh, that's all wrapped up. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that, Oliver. I was definitely uh, thrown back to my stats A level uh, for a moment there. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from chat. We have just a, a, a minute to go through them. Uh, the first and probably quickest to answer is, is the Alibi example Jupyter Notebook available somewhere for people to download? Yeah, it will be. I think I was saying about this when I probably disconnected, but I'll probably tweet that from our Twitter account later um, so people can work through that more slowly um, if they desire. So yeah, do give us a follow and uh, yeah, I'll get that tweeted out. All right, and a question from earlier, uh, which was given, as you said, that after deployment, we don't often have access to why being true. Can these methods only detect covariate drifts? Um, and then, but you also said that if PX, only PX changes, then the original model is still valid. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. If if the drift is purely um, sort of concept drift where only the relationship between the targets and the features has changed, then sure, we can't detect that by looking solely at the features. But normally, when a change occurs, more than one component changes, and therefore, you're able to sort of detect that the changes happened in general. Um, and if, yes, yeah, so the model is potentially still valid if only the feature distribution has changed. But as I said, the performance might have really degraded. And it's important to be aware of that because the model may no longer be suitable for the problem that you're trying to solve. So although it may still have the best decision boundary given the context, it may then no longer be suitable to deploy, for example. But yeah, that's a good question. All right, we've got a couple more coming in from the chat. Um, and we are about to run into lunch, which is okay, because we're not running into anybody else's talk. Hey, great. Okay. Um, for your windowing strategies, have you tried using time lagged approaches where window sizes is ever increasing? Yeah, so the so I guess that sounds pretty similar to these adaptive windows um, that I was describing. I'm not sure if the, the if they meant something slightly different, but those they allow the window to grow. And that's great, but that means that the cost of operating these detectors can then also grow sort of unboundedly, and uh, that's not really something you want. And also it makes set of, setting the thresholds like much, much more trickier. So I was talking a lot about targeting and expected runtime, and that's tricky to do using these windows that grow. Um, so there is that sort of that compromise of using overlapping windows in order to allow a well, fixed size and allow so that a desired runtime can be targeted. Yeah. So there's pros and cons in all over the place with these uh, strategies. Yeah. It's always the way, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and one final question from chat, which is, would you see an issue in using an embedding model for the distance, which is very close to the model for the predictions? For example, using a base uh, BERT, B-E-R-T, for embedding in the case of a fine-tuned BERT for the predictions? Yeah, so there is, so this is a good point that you shouldn't use for the projection a component that has been trained on the same reference instance is being used by the detector because then the component then sort of hooks these um, instances and they and puts them into a different sort of region so it does where it does unseen instances and that sort of causes a discrepancy that isn't due to change in the underlying distribution but it's just being because they've been seen before so it is important that you don't train the component using the same data and you'll see in the notebook that actually split off a bit of the data to train um to train the projection and then pass a separate split of the data to the detector. And yeah, that's a very good point. That's that's an important consideration to make. I have a follow-up question about that. Is there any rhyme or reason to how you would split the data set for those two those two um, partitions? Yeah, so obviously again, it's a compromise and the, the more data used to fit the um, projection, the more potentially like, meaningful that projection will be, the better the test statistic will then be. Um, but then the less data you then have to pass to the detector and therefore the sort of less statistical power you have with which to detect drift. So there is sort of that compromise. And I recommend sort of using the smallest amount of data that you believe is sufficient to train um, whatever component you're trying to train. And um, so that does require potentially a bit of domain knowledge. But yeah, I wouldn't, it's not something I'd worry too much about at the exact split point. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for that answer. Um, I don't think we have any more questions coming in from chat. Um, so I would just say thank you so very much for this talk. It was really, really interesting. And thank you so much for um, giving your time to Europython. Great, thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone. Thanks.